The 2015 Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. So, very interesting people tend to introduce themselves in a certain way. One of them is, when I'm not this, I'm that. For example, when I'm not cleaning up the city, I'm volunteering to help stray dogs. Or, when I'm not kayaking, I'm volunteering to help the homeless. Something like this. It needs to give you the, uh, the impression that they're always active. They're always doing something interesting. And they're worth talking to. So I tried to do this. And for me, I wanted to be honest, so I thought, when I'm not studying languages, I'm leaking. <laughs> So then I saw a video about a month ago from Benny Lewis, who had this great idea to teach you languages when you're sleeping. I thought, wow, I can go from part-time learning to all the time. This is perfect for me. But unfortunately, it was just an April Fool's prank. <laughs> so I want to introduce this talk. It's going to be about lessons I've drawn from ancient philosophers that I can apply to language learning myself, starting with the fact that this is all from self-study. I'm not an academic philosopher, I don't have a degree in philosophy, so that being said, it's also coming from personal experience. So these two things mean that I definitely want to hear from you afterward. If you have something to uh, discuss with me, something to share, or something to correct me on from your experience or from your study of philosophy, please tell me afterwards. Also, philosophy is a really, really big thing. It's probably the biggest thing, enormous. So I can't possibly cover all of it. So if there's something you thought I left out, also please share that at the end. There probably is a lot I've left out. So here's a preview of the lessons that we'll talk about. First is the German problem. Uh, then we'll use stoic minimalism in choosing what to learn. We'll feel the rhythm, feel the rhyme. And of course that means it's Bob Flood time. Uh, we'll learn how mnemonics are actually like sunburn. We'll uh, talk about the stubborn quintile, which I think is a term I made up, but maybe not. Uh, we'll learn that sometimes you need to just treat yourself. And we'll learn about collection fetishism and Epicurus. And we'll talk about reflecting on your life and its brevity to end on a nice, uh, positive note. <laughs> <laughs> so first I want to talk about my problem with German. Uh, I don't think it's unique to me. No. But, uh, <laughs> in fact, most of the presenters here at the conference, that's the language they've said they struggled with the most, which is interesting, considering I'm learning Chinese now. Uh, but I have four words for you. Unterstützen, Anleitung, Entscheiden, and Nützlich. I'm not actually sure if Nützlich is a word. Nützlich. Okay, this proves my point, actually. <laughs> so what do these words have in common? Can anyone guess? What do they have in common? Okay. <laughs> what they have in common is, I know them with the exception of the last one, but I don't know what they mean at all. So I've heard them, I can read them fairly well. I have no clue what they mean, no idea. I know that I've seen them, I know that I've learned them, but I don't know what they are. This is something I think is interesting. So there's two possibilities here with this problem I have with German. One of them is, that these are unintegrated matter with no forms. The second one first. For example, I can't remember how to say duck in Chinese, and there's me struggling at the bottom. You can see the resemblance. That means it's unintegrated matter with no forms. I know that I've learned how to say duck, but I can't remember what it is in Chinese. Or, I know I've learned the word for duck, or excuse me, I know I've, I've learned, uh, what is it, cow ya. That's roast duck, yeah. Yeah, I've learned yeah, but I can't remember what, what that means. So this is coming from an idea from Plato. I don't know how familiar you are, so I'll just share. Uh, Plato has an idea of a world of forms, and then the physical world, of which we just have the tangible things, like this table. So how do we know it, it is what it is? We know because it matches with the form version that's like the perfect table somewhere, or the perfect duck. So from this, teaching of Plato, I, I learned the lesson that if you have disconnected forms with no matter, you can't remember anything in another language. And if you have unintegrated matter, 
with no forms, you also can't remember anything in another language. So you need to somehow solve this problem. So here's the philosophical lesson. You need to connect the vocabulary items, which are your unintegrated matter, with the forms somehow for a fuller understanding. So if this doesn't make sense to you, the picture is there to help you with the idea I'm trying to think of. On the one hand, you have the idea of a duck, and the other, you have no idea what to say. And then the reverse is also true. So here are some suggestions for how to fix this problem. Uh, some typical solutions include uh, assigning a single keyword to it. Especially if uh, you have a language like Chinese, you could have a character or a word with 10 or 12 different definition items. But if you can make it simpler on yourself and just say, okay, for now, xiang is just going to mean want. I know it can mean other things, it's fine, but I'm just going to think it's want, so that every time I see xiang, it's going to be want, or want is going to be xiang, for now. So assign a single keyword, this is a good way. Uh, you can place it in a lot of contexts uh, or different categories, which I think Blue Blue, Blue does this automatically, um, but only if you happen to encounter the word there. So I don't think there's a way to search for it in Blue Blue, but you can put the word in question in many contexts to help you to uh, kind of categorize it better. Uh, there's a website called tatueba.org, which has a lot of uh, example sentences translated in multiple languages. And this is really helpful for having different contexts with this one, you can actually search by the word to see five or six ways it's used and connect your forms with your matter in that way. Um, you can also memorize it in association. Uh, one way to do it is with phrasal vocabulary. So instead of learning duck, you can learn like uh, walks like a duck or tastes like roast duck or something like this. So you have other things going on rather than just this isolated, meaningless form that has no matter at all. Uh, Glossica mass sentences are really great for this. Uh, this is another, this is actually a product by someone in the community. Um, and this is essentially just, maybe I think it's thousands of contexts for the vocabulary you're learning instead of just a word list. I know word lists have their, um, their benefits and there's going to be a talk on word lists as well later in the conference, but this is good for if you want a context around them. And of course using it as soon as possible, speaking from day one, etc. cetera. Uh, you could write a whole composition about ducks. <laughs> If you really got tired of forgetting it, on um, Lang 8, that's another one too. Okay, here's the meat. Down at the bottom we have a quote from Seneca, who is a Stoic philosopher. It says, simplicity and straightforwardness are in keeping with goodness, which is one of the founding philosophical ideas behind Tokipona. Tokipona is a language with only 123 words in it total. It was created about 14 years ago by a Canadian woman who was here last year, and I gave a talk on it last year. And one of the things I mentioned was the philosophical benefits of Tokipono, one of which has to do with Stoicism. <clears throat> Stoicism was, and still is, a philosophical movement that began in, I believe it was in ancient Rome, and it was uh, essentially in uh, Greece. In Greece? Yes. Oh, forgive me. Zeno was Greek. Uh, Zeno was Greek? Okay. In ancient Greece, and then later was adopted by Romans like Seneca. Um, and it, uh, it stressed being minimalistic and uh, doing away with what you didn't need. So it's, it can be very efficient. It has a lot of lessons for us as language learners because there's many things that we don't need at all uh, in order to progress and meet our goals. One of the things about Tokipona and Stoicism is that it forces you to be honest. You don't have all these extra filler words. You don't have all these extra ways of describing things and expressing yourself. So you learn only what's essential in Tokipona because that's all there is to learn. All you have is the essential 123. I only have so much to say because I only have so much to say it with. So what you can do is extrapolate from Tokipona a language learning method for other languages by learning only the essential words and constructions that you need to talk about anything. So this was an idea I had about uh, Tokipona last year. I shared in brief, but now I get to explain it a little better. So let's say you want to learn uh, French, and you want to be able to express yourself in any topic you want, but you don't want to learn 10,000, 20,000 words to do it. Instead, you can try to take, for example, Tokipona's vocabulary list, add a few things that are unique in French grammar, like relative clauses that are not in Tokipona, and you can probably talk about virtually any topic as long as you know what you're talking about. <laughs> 
So, for example, if you want to talk about um, how to hook up the electric wiring in the house, I can't talk about this in English, much less anything else. So in this way, both this method and Tokipona force you to be honest, because you're not allowed to BS. You're not allowed to just talk in open air and pretend you know what you're talking about. You have to be an honest person when you use this method, because you have to explain what is the copper wiring, why is it important, where do you put it, and this kind of thing. And also, this increases your ability to circumlocute, or talk in a circle, to level 9,000, because you can't, uh, you can't say directly copper wiring in Tokibana, or in this simplified French that you would learn with the extrapolated method, because it's impossible. There's no word for it. So you have to be able to talk around it and say, well, it's made of metal, and they, if you want to explain the process, they make it into sheets and wrap it around, and this kind of thing. So the philosophy behind this is, with stoicism and minimalism applied, you can make it and get by with only what you need, and be very ascetic and efficient in your language learning. I'll talk about this a little bit more later. Uh, these terms, by what I mean by these terms, ascetic has to do with closing yourself off and really focusing on what you're doing. And then the efficiency is, is clear, I hope. Next, I want to talk about feeling the rhythm. And here's me dancing. So here's a quote from Plato again. I would teach the children music, physics, and philosophy, but the most important is music, for in the patterns of the arts are the keys to all learning. So by feeling the rhythm, I mean adding music into your language learning if you haven't already. And I don't just mean listening to music. Don't just listen to music in a foreign language. That's not what Plato's talking about at all. Everyone listens to music for entertainment. And if you saw the, the talk about 10 Asian languages in 50 minutes, we listened to music in Thai and Vietnamese and many other languages. But I didn't learn those languages by listening to that music, although I wish I could have. Uh, you may also know a woman by the name of Susanna Zarysky who makes languages music. This is really her domain. Um, and she recommends these types of things as well. Uh, Tim Doner as well credits a lot of his learning of Farsi from listening to the music and getting him hooked on the language and uh, getting him accustomed to the sounds. But I'm not just talking about using music. I'm talking about really using music to learn and not just as entertainment. So I'll give you two examples of what I mean. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Adams, Jackson, Van Buren, Harrison, Tyler, Pocan, Taylor, Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, Lincoln, Johnson, Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Cleveland, Harrison, Cleveland, McKinley, Roosevelt, Taft, Wilson, Hardy, Coolidge, Hoover, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, George Bush, Clinton, Bush, Obama. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the next one is shorter. <laughs> Vice <laughs> president. Uh, the next one is aboard, about, above, across, after, against, along, among, around, at, before, behind, below, beneath, beside, between, beyond, by, down, during, except for, from, in, inside, into, like, near, of, off, on, over, past, since, through, throughout, to, toward, under, underneath, until, up, upon, with, within, without. Yes. <laughs> Those are the prepositions in English in alphabetical order. Oh. <laughs> What you can do with this is use the music to learn something, and not just as background material or supplementary material. You can put something into your mind with the music and not just the lyrics to some song, etc. <clears throat> so I want to talk about how mnemonics are sunburned very briefly. For those who don't know what a mnemonic is, it's a memory tool that you came up with. It's my best definition. Um, for example, I before E, except after C, and then sounding like A is in neighbor and way. Yeah, this is a spelling mnemonic for English. <clears throat> uh, first of all, the ancients created mnemonics, and this gentleman by the name of Simonides is the alleged creator of mental imagery mnemonics. Mental imagery mnemonics like the method of loci, <clears throat> or memory palaces, they're called. Uh, there's a talk, I think, later today by Anthony Tibier, who is a specialist in making these memory palaces. I'd be very interested to tell you more about this as well. Um, but the two songs I just sang for you uh, are regrettable for a number of reasons. One of them that I have a cold. <laughs> the other is that there's no way out of these songs now. So I have the US presidents in order, and I have the English prepositions in alphabetical order. 
in my head forever. I learned them when I was probably eight years old. I'm not eight years old anymore. <laughs> I'm getting very regretful that they're there because there's no way out. I can't escape them anymore. There's no way to get them away. And I also can't use them. <clears throat> so it's just dead weight. It's taking up space in my mind. But it illustrates a point that these two are relatively useless information. <clears throat> it's not important to be able to list these things, especially for a native English speaker. I don't need to know the English prepositions in order. I even probably less need to know the presidents in order. But it illustrates the point that you can do this with any list of arbitrary information. And if it's a grammar rule, or the cases, or something like this, the provinces in China, you want to remember the names of them, it's not arbitrary information. So even the most boring material, like prepositions, you could put it into your brain and they'd be there forever even if you didn't want them there. So I think that's pretty important. But mnemonics, even like these, should have a curfew, in my opinion. They should have a curfew. The example I'm giving here is the I before E rule. I remember that nursery rhyme that we learned in, in grade school, like many of you probably do. But the point is that I've spelled enough words in English to forget the mnemonic entirely when I'm spelling words. And I also forget that there even is a mnemonic for this. So I've written the words receive and believe in emails and on paper enough times that I don't think, wait, I before, what is it, I before, wait, this, receive, this is a C, I before, e. it doesn't happen. I don't need to do it. This is the goal of using mnemonics, in my opinion. You're supposed to have a memory tool only for a very short time. The shorter the amount of time you have it, the better, in my opinion. So, maybe I wanted to remember the presidents in order to know that Lincoln came after Washington or something like this, or I wanted to ace a test where we have to list them in order. But then it should be gone. As soon as I can use the information, as soon as I can do something with it, I need to get it out of there and replace it with something else. So when should you use a mnemonic? Well, I think you should only use it for the stubborn quintile. This is me struggling with the stubborn quintile. Quintile, by quintile I mean the 20% uh, of what you learn. So roughly 20%, give or take about 3%, is what I've found I still can't get into my brain through traditional learning methods like flashcards or going through the list or covering half of it or uh, having a conversation and trying to use it. All these things, I, can't, I still can't get about 20% of it in there. So if you're using mnemonics for everything you come across in a new language, I think you're wasting your time. You should only use it for the things that you can't get uh, by other means. And you don't need them otherwise as well, so don't use them. Uh, one example of this problem, people doing this, is when people learn Japanese kanji with all of the on and kun readings in a huge mega mnemonic device. So if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, Jap every Japanese character that comes from its Chinese heritage has different readings, so if you see it on paper, it could sound different depending on what word it's in or what the context is. And if you take the time to learn all of the readings, individual readings, as one big unit of information, like the president song, it's a huge waste of time, and the mnemonic isn't necessary for you. So instead, you can think about learning the words that they're in, like um, instead of learning then, for electricity, you could learn densha, which I think is a train. Is that right? Yeah. You could learn densha as a unit instead. And that way you're learning the readings of Japanese characters without using endless mnemonics that just have you reciting a board about, above, across, after again in Japanese. Uh, an example of good use, I hope, because it's an idea I had, is the tone coupling method, which is just a, a silly way I came up with of remembering which tones go with which uh, Chinese words. So for example, there's a word that means ruins, uh, or like something destroyed, and it's fei xu in Chinese. And this is fourth tone, fei, and first tone, xu, fei xu. The way I remember this is that 41, in my mind, stands for the President of the United States. The theme is coming up again and again. So in my mind, I have an image of the president, President Bush probably, uh, stepping over some ruins and like kind of struggling to get over them. So now I have this idea that F-E-I-X-U in pinyin is the word for ruins, but the way to remember the tone is by having this mnemonic, oh, face you, 41. 
that's the suitable example. So in conclusion, the end goal of using a memory tool or a mnemonic device is to get rid of it. The whole point of having a memory tool is to not have it anymore. Once you've used it, please do away with it. Uh, and here we have a quote from Cicero about Simonides. The story goes that Simonides was enabled by his recollection and that this circumstance suggested to him the discovery of the truth that the best aid to clearness of memory consists in orderly arrangement. Where you place things matters, and when you place them in your mind, you should probably try to keep them there only as long as you need them. Um, if any of you have any experience of using uh, the method of loci or the um, memory palaces, please share that with me afterwards. I want to hear about it. Um, so with the memory tool, you want to force common enough use that it becomes second nature. I believe that those two songs are still in my mind because I have not been able to force common enough use that they became second nature. There's no way to make the list of presidents second nature. But with I before E except after C, I still remember the mnemonic, but I don't need it anymore. So it's effectively gone. When I'm writing an email or something, I don't need to use it. And we don't want to just ace the test with language learning. We want to speak fluently. So if you found a way to remember all the Russian cases and endings, or instrumental, prepositional, et cetera, et cetera, with a song, it doesn't matter if you can't use them when you speak or write. So a quick word on the memory palaces. Uh, this is a reason I want to hear from some of you about this. But it seems like the goal of discarding the mnemonic is virtually impossible with the memory palaces, which uh, may be a good thing because you can't forget it. But also, uh, maybe it's taking up some memory space, some RAM, if you will, in the brain. Uh, it also seems uh, useful for things that are in a certain order, like the presidents, for example. When you're walking through the house, the image of the house in your mind, or opening boxes and drawers and finding things in them that you've used to remember, it seems like if you disrupted the order, you'd be uh, out of luck. Uh, my German problem that I talked about in the first slide of detaching the meanings and the forms from the matter, that could happen a lot, it seems. Because you open the drawer in the living room, and I know I put a candle in here, but what was the word for candle again? That could feel like that could happen. So let's please discuss after if you have some suggestions for the rest of us. So here's a lovely picture for you. I don't know if you can see it very well. <clears throat> But this is a picture of a staircase with a lot of books on it. These are my books from uh, my hometown before I left for Asia. And uh, I had to say goodbye to them. So like you do with pets or any loved ones, I took a memento photograph uh, just to keep them near my heart. Uh, but I'll never get, probably never get the opportunity to touch any of these books again. <clears throat> um, but actually, I had a lot of opportunities to touch them. And I didn't use many of them. Uh, if you can see clearly, I don't think you can. Let me see if I can point them out to you. <clears throat> Here we have a Hebrew dictionary. This is a Norwegian dictionary. This is a comic book in Japanese. These are Romanian. Dutch verbs. Some Langenscheidt, I think ancient Greek is in there. Italian vocabulary. This is a Hungarian dictionary. Russian down there. These are all languages I don't speak. <laughs> <laughs> So there's even a Facebook group for people like me. <laughs> it's not a support group, it's a Facebook group. With a collection fetish. Yeah. We enjoy collecting these things, the language materials. Oh, the new Asimil is out. Oh, the new teacher itself. I want to flip through it or buy it. And that's essentially the end. But this is actually a pretty meager, slender collection here. Uh, compared to shelves and shelves and rooms and rooms that some of these uh, these language learners have. I may or may not be uh, admin of that group. <laughs> <laughs> so this is talking about treating yourself. There's an idea in, uh, recently in, in American uh, culture about treating yourself that came from this TV show called Parks and Recreation, uh, where you should actually just take some time and do something only for your enjoyment, purely and try not to feel bad about it or feel guilty about obligations or responsibilities you have, but just to treat yourself. Go have a, a chocolate bar or something. <coughs> treat yourself now and then. Um, so the stoic question for this 
is what does all of this get me? We have all these books, we have all these CDs maybe, we've downloaded all of these things, we have all these MP3s from the top learners, we have et cetera, et cetera, all these resources available to us, we have all these tools. But what does it really get me? So Plato wants us to think about a craftsman, somebody that's working on something, a carpenter, and you open his garage and slide up the door and there's just hammers and hammers and hammers and wrenches and screwdrivers and everything you can imagine. All different sizes, all different ages. Here's a, a legacy hammer from 1910 and he has everything. Yeah, all the resources possible to do what you need to, all the tools. But what, do they, what use are they to him if he hasn't learned how to handle them and has never bestowed any attention upon them? So these now, a year or so, less than a year later, have gathered dust in my old home in America. And that's not a different situation than when I lived there with them. But the Epicurean answer to this, coming from Epicurus, is that this brings you happiness. So treating yourself every now and then is actually a way to enjoy the process. And if you're not enjoying the process, then the process is going to suffer, and so are you. So collecting resources, if it's books, or it's bookmarks online, or it's videos on YouTube that you want to watch later, these things, you can collect them without feeling guilt for it. This is stemming from a, a difference between the Stoics and the Epicureans. Uh, Epicurus was known in his time by other writers as a philosopher who liked to indulge himself, and overindulge, they would say but just have these enormous feasts and parties, and everyone is uh, doing very hedonistic things, eating the most delicious grapes and enjoying the best wine and laughing and having a good time. And this was his idea of the good life. Contrasted with the Stoics who said, you don't need a fancy car, you don't need a lot of money, you only need enough to survive and study philosophy. Which is a rather Tokipona way of looking at the language. Also there's gold listing which is an idea that came, was come up with by a man named David James, who sadly can't be here. Um, gold listing is a very, very Epicurean activity because Epicurus stresses enjoying the process and doing things with as much uh, positive environment that you possibly can. So if you're in a place with hospital lighting and it smells terrible and you're tired and you haven't had any coffee and you're sweating, if you try to study languages like this, it's going to be horrible for you. Instead, you should try to get the nicest pen you can that has a good weight in hand, and get a really nice notebook and open it up flat, sit at your desk calmly, comfortably, get the lighting correct, and write slowly, carefully, and enjoy it. And this is a way you can activate your, your long-term memory and put the words and the information directly into your long-term memory without stressing about it. This is an extremely Epicurean uh, concept. So lastly, I want to reflect on our lives and the brevity of each one. <coughs> Here we have a photo of, uh, of me. T.S. <laughs> Eliot said, uh, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. And so this is me using Anki, so that's what it looks like when I do that. <laughs> but at the bottom we have a quote here. It's not that we have a short space of time, but that we waste much of it. Life is long enough and it's been given in sufficiently gracious measure to allow the accomplishment of the very greatest things if the whole of it is well invested. This idea comes from the Stoics, Seneca being one of them, uh, that if you use your time well, you don't, need, you don't feel that you need any more of it. So when I'm learning languages, I always feel that I have no time for anything. Uh, it's, it's been the cause of a lot of personal disagreements with people. It's been the cause of more than one breakup because I simply can't stop giving my time to this hobby. So I want to talk to you about the number 8,000. 8,000, if you're learning Chinese, doesn't seem like a very big number because you're accustomed to them. <laughs> but uh, I want to tell you a story about it. Uh, I found that with Asian language learning material, meaning language learning material that's marketed to Asian markets, they really focus on the number of things you're going to get from the book. So you'll see like 10,000 ways to do this, or 300 best this, or the 500 most commonly used words, or something like this. So I found a fantastic book called uh, 8,000 Example Sentences in Japanese to illustrate the grammar. I thought, wow, 8,000? I can get 8,000. And it's only, whoa, it's 18 yuan. This is great. So I bought it. 
And I found another one that was 8,000 example sentences in Korean to illustrate the grammar and teach you vocabulary. I thought, 16,000 sentences, that's enough to talk to anybody. Wow, I'm done. Two languages out of the way. <clears throat> but then I started to look at it. I was trying to put these sentences into Anki because I really believed in the flashcards as a way to remember these things. So I thought about it. I've got 8,000 sentences here. I've inserted about 12 by now. This is a day later. There's two books, two languages. There's three languages I'm putting in, which was English, Japanese, and Chinese. And it takes about five minutes to do a single sentence, to input a single sentence and switch the keyboards and everything. So when you do all this multiplication, if you spend an hour on just this rote activity, not learning, just putting the cards into Anki yourself, it would take 11 years to finish. I don't think that's using your time very well. And each of us has the same amount of time as all the others. So instead, what you want to do is think about this massive boulder of language learning. It's a huge stone in your way. And you want to shape something beautiful with a good accent and a lovely sound and the correct words. You want to chip away at it. But if each chip at the stone is so tiny, then the boulder seems really, really big. Every time you take a swing and knock off a piece, if you've got a tiny little screwdriver, it's going to take you maybe 11 years to make the Michelangelo. Or not the Michelangelo. What's his name? The David. To make the David, it'll take about 11 years. So that's why it feels like you're wasting your time. If you have this immense goal, it's because you're not focusing on how short your life actually is. That's what Seneca would say. So if you have a goal like mine, 8,000 or 16,000 things, and you're not thinking about how long will this take me, what's my realistic end game here, then you must think, said Seneca, that you live forever. You must think that it's just going to keep going and going forever. You're, you're, there's no end to you if you have all this unlimited time. So the solution I came up with is to whittle away at the stone. So instead of taking these long strides and knocking off a centimeter of stone when you're trying to sculpt, you can whittle away at it over time and make it more manageable for yourself. The way I do this is with a program, it's a website and a program called Habit RPG. An RPG is a role-playing game. Uh, this may not be your speed, but you can find similar things that are, have the same effect. Essentially, I use Habit RPG to keep me into the idea of small wins. You can use this program to make tiny, tiny, tiny changes to the stone that over time, because you're incentivized to make 100 of them a day or something like this, will shape it quicker. And you can focus on the other things in your very short life. <laughs> uh, so a real life example of using this is when I learned 800 Chinese characters. Uh, I started last September, and I said, OK, the deadline is Christmas Day, I want to be able to recognize, read aloud with the pronunciation, and write 800 Chinese characters, because I was told this was a baseline of reading, which is actually not true, but <laughs> that's another talk. So what I did was I put in a daily habit of 12 characters into Habit RPG, and what the program was able to help me do was reward me or punish me for each time I missed it or made it. If I was successful, I got rewards, and I was able to do things in the game, etc., progress, buy things with the in-game money, whatever. And if I lost, then I could lose it all. So if you go five days and do 60, then you could lose it all the first time you lose. So it incentivizes you in the same way that the Jerry Seinfeld calendar marking X's does. Um, and it worked. So on Christmas Day, I got very excited and put on a Santa hat and made a video about how I learned 800 Chinese characters. Um, it worked perfectly for me. Okay, so I want to finish with uh, something quickly that I added without a slide for some of us here that I think deserve to hear this. Let me pull it up here. So I have a special message for those who may feel less accomplished than others. 
Uh, I'd like to think that I'm in the young generation of this community of language learning people, unless, of course, you count uh, Tim Doner, who I think is 19 years old now, or 20. Uh, but I don't think his age is going to catch up with his languages anytime soon. Um, but I'm about as old as The Simpsons, so I'm still looking for the kind of mentor relationship that these philosophers had. So when you're learning about philosophy, you never learned it on your own with a book in your room. This is a modern idea, something we do now to learn these things. In the old days, which makes me sound like I was there, but I wasn't. <laughs> in the ancient times, there was a master of philosophy or someone people wanted to listen to, and the others came to hear from him, and they had a relationship with him. Most of the time it was him back then. This is the kind of relationship I'm looking for in the language learning community, because I think you get a lot more out of language learning when you're not doing it by yourself. If there's a way to connect each other to each other, then that's the best way to, to proceed. So last year, I remember having the opportunity to be with and get to know so many of the people that I consider real titans of language learning. And I'm the only one who uses that term, but I recommend it because the people rise above the seeming, uh, the seeming struggles we all have. And I remember when I met them, the experience of meeting them prompted me to write about how much I fell in love with this community of people and these language learners, and uh, also prompted me to do everything I can, including coming for about 20 hours on planes and in airports to be here from Beijing, just so I could spend more time with you all. And there's a certain video uh, featuring an amazing man named Emanuele Marini that I met last year. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be with him in Berlin for a meal, but unfortunately I couldn't speak any languages sufficiently well to get to know him. And I thought perhaps if the mentor relationship were there, I could have done that. Um, so this video is of him demonstrating his languages in Budapest in the first Polyglot Conference. If you haven't see it, seen it, please look it up. And um, it's really astounding, uh, this video. You should see it. So I want to share with you what Seneca had to say about the feeling you can have, you, those of you who feel less accomplished, when you behold such a titan as this. You're looking at this massive statue of accomplishment, and you feel small. First, there's nothing more wretched than worrying about your future. There's enough things to worry about right now, like the pain in your foot, and the fact that your voice sounds terrible, and you feel tired. There's enough to worry about right now, that you don't need to worry about the future, which you can't even change or control. Second, you should treat each day as a separate life. These are actually Seneca's words translated. Every morning when you wake up, you get to start anew. You're not in yesterday anymore, and you're certainly not in tomorrow. It's obvious, and it sounds condescending for Seneca to tell us this, but if you treat every single day as a separate life, then suddenly the things that worried you yesterday don't matter anymore. The things that he was able to do 10 years ago that got him where he is don't matter anymore. Third, you should never postpone anything. Anything. Make it your goal to do just one. This is how you can whittle away at the massive stone. Make it your goal to do just one. So if you have 8,000 of anything you want to do, for example, vocabulary, make it your goal to do one. It makes the, the project seem much smaller and more manageable. And you'll find that you often do more than one when that's your only goal. There was a man I met once who did uh, 1,100 push-ups a day, I think. But he didn't just start and get down and do 1,100. He said, when I started, I was overweight and out of shape, and I didn't have what I wanted. You can see the parallels with language learning here. He said, my goal when I started was to do one push-up. So what happened was, okay, it'll take three seconds. He got down and did one push-up. He said, well, one push-up, I'll do two. Two push-ups. All right, I'm already down here, I'll do three, four. He did as many as he could, which I think was 12. Uh, and he was embarrassed by the number, which is also, there's a parallel for language learning there. But what happened was, the day after, the months after, the years after, he was able to work his way up from tiny, tiny chips at the stone by making it his goal to just do one. This is definitely true of Anki reviews, if you've ever used this program, because the, the more generous you get with giving yourself tasks to do in it, 
the more cruel it is to you. <laughs> so you get very excited and say, oh, I have all this free time. I'm going to try and do uh, 400 new cards. That'd be great. I got like two hours. Awesome. Let's do 400 new cards. Great, 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 great. Got them. The next day, suddenly you have 420 reviews to do. Hmm, okay. The following day, even more, even more. So the more you put into it, the more Anki seems to punish you for it. <coughs> so fourth, and this one is coming from me, not from Seneca. Uh, I want you to remember, those of you who feel less accomplished, that there's no meaningful comparison between lives. And uh, you can achieve what somebody else can. And fifth, uh, this one is from Luca, who sadly can't be here. Uh, after this video of Emanuele doing these amazing things, Luca came and took the microphone in front of the camera, and he said that passion is the only necessity in achieving it. He said, what you just saw, you can do. You really can do this, too. But you just need passion. So never give up, and never postpone anything. That's all.